Hi, everybody. I'm Brittany Lewis, a breaking news reporter here at Forbes. Joining me now is Forbes contributor and award-winning marketer, Dr. Marcus Collins. Dr. Collins, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. Of course, and as we know, late last month, former President Donald Trump's mugshot was released after he was booked at the Fulton County Jail in Atlanta. And you wrote for Forbes that he turned that jail photo into a $7 million marketing lesson. Explain how. I mean, essentially, Donald Trump did what good marketers do, that they understand that meaning is not fixed, that meaning is subjective. And therefore, we can take things that may seem negative and subvert them in such a way that it has new meaning frames. For Trump, a mugshot typically is a symbol of shame. It is a, a receipt of criminality. However, refashioning this as merchandise was a way by which it became a signal of pride, a signal of strength. And saying that, you know, ironically, never surrender, even though he was surrendering in the actual deal with the mugshot, was a way by which he was able to reframe what would be a negative thing for him to something that's actually a sign of strength for him. And people who see the world the way he does, where what he stands for is aligned with how they see the world, there's congruence there, they then therefore view the mugshot in a different way than people who see the world differently and see it as something that's negative. I do want to get your perspective on the line, never surrender, because essentially when you get a mugshot taken, you are surrendering. He did fly down to Georgia. He did surrender in the Fulton County Jail. How was he able to really successfully use that tagline with the photo, with the mugshot rather, because that juxtaposition just doesn't really make sense? Yeah, because things aren't the way they are. They are the way that we are, right? So things on the surface that seem so obvious aren't as obvious to everyone because of how they see the world. For instance, you take January 6th, for some of them, it is obviously an insurrection. I mean, there's, so, there's unbelievable evidence, some, some mounting evidence that this was an insurrection. But for others, when they see that event, they say these are just patriots that are standing up for their country. They're taking back their country. But which one is it? Actually, it's both of them. Because things aren't the way they are, they are the way that we are. That's why for some, a cow is leather, for others it's a deity, and for some it's dinner. Which one is it? It's all of those things based on how they see the world. So what may seem so rational and so ironic, so such a juxtaposition uh, with regards to the action that took place and what the language says, it means different things to different people. And the way you can subvert meaning depends on your understanding and intimacy with the cultural frames by which that meaning is being translated. Were you surprised he was able to market his mugshot this way? Because I think before really 2015, when he announced that he was running, this would really be a nail in the coffin for a presidential contender. So what do you yeah. think? Uh, I think that Trump has showed us evidence for since he's been on the political stage that the rules do not apply to him. Right. Um, when uh, during the debate with Hillary Clinton, when she when she challenged him on his taxes, and he says, yeah, I didn't pay taxes because I'm smart. That means I'm smart. And what for some of like, no, that means that you're breaking the law. For others, like, see how savvy he is? He's able to subvert, you know, what we normal common folk get, get are ob obliged to do. If only we could be that smart. Trump has, has had, he's been very successful at his ability to subvert what seems to be one thing and making it something, something else. Now, whether that's good or bad, that depends on how you see the world. That too is sub subjective, uh, but it, it's 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 a it's a skill uh, in in the way it's done. Uh, but unfortunately, it has very very costly ramifications. What are those costly ramifications? Can you dive a little deeper in there for us? I mean, when we subvert reality in such a way that that matches our worldview, even though they are detrimental to democracy, even though they pit people uh, uh, against each other in, a, in an act of combating civility, they lead to tearing at the fabric of society uh, in a very meaningful way. And that is costly, and that is quite dangerous. So while it may serve him and his needs and wants in, in political and business aspirations, I think ultimately it becomes detrimental to the fabric of society, what we call American culture. So such divisiveness uh, has helped him and, and, and people who are within his faction. But I think by and large, they've, they've created chaos for, for society. And those things uh, are, are, are quite dangerous. 
Do you think in turn then any other leader could really use this marketing strategy to their own personal advantage like he has? Because for years, he's been described by many as Teflon Don. Yeah, yeah. Um, we've seen leaders do this. Um, if you think about the, 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 the war on wokeness, you know, wokeness, uh, it, it's sort of been refashioned as a negative thing where the idea of being woke come from the predominant uh, black community as a way of, of communicating a state of consciousness, of being aware of the things around you. And this was considered to be a very positive thing to be woke, but that language has been subverted, refashioned, reworked to be now a negative thing. And they have driven political, uh, political dogma uh, and political gains in such a way that has been detrimental to people, especially people who look like me. CRT, similar in, in nature, you know, these things uh, have benefited the political aspirations of groups of people while uh, being oppressive and violent for people uh, who, who aren't of the same ilk. So Teflon Don, I mean, we'll, we'll see how, 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 hard, how well that title holds up, that moniker holds up considering all the legal, uh, the legal trouble he's found himself in, some of which seems to be uh, the, 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 the results are, are, are going to be you know, evident in, in the evidence that's mounting against him. Um, but either way, I think that while these things provide benefits in their ability to influence behavior, we have to be very mindful about what are the consequences thereof. And, and the reworking of the mugshot, the reframing of CRT, the reframing of wokeness, the war on culture and all these things, these cultural roles we find ourselves in, while they may have some temporal benefit for those who are doing the reworking, I think they have significant negative, uh, destructive uh, implications on society writ large. I do want to talk a little bit more about that reframing of the mugshot. When that was released, that obviously went massively viral. I was at dinner and everyone's phone was blowing up. We pulled out our phones. We were talking about the mugshot. It was dissected all over social media. And right away, something I noticed was Donald Trump did return to Twitter. He or now X and he did post <laughs> that mugshot. His kids posted it. People were saying in his his supporters were saying, look how tough he looks, look how strong he looks. It was a symbol of strength. Has anyone else ever used their mugshot and flipped the script on their mugshot like this? Yeah, I mean, think about Frank Sinatra's mugshot. He looked like a cool kid because of it, right? Um, we've seen this with Nelson Mandela. Mandela. We've seen this with, with Malcolm X, that are, even with Rosa Parks. You know, these mugshots, while they have connotations that are negative, they have been subverted to mean different things, right? For Nelson Mandela, it was a, a signal of conviction that he was willing to, to stand uh, for, for what he believes to such a degree that he'll go to jail for it. For Malcolm X, it was his mugshot when he was Malcolm Little, before he had converted to Islam and became an activist, that it became a signal, a signifier that people can change, that there can be uh, retribution, that they can, there can be uh, 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 some rehabilitation, as it were. For Rosa Parks, it was about resilience and resistance uh, with regards to, to, to one's beliefs, that these things have, have worked in the past before. So this isn't new ground that we've seen Donald Trump uh, uh, tread. However, we've never seen it in this context in a way that's typically been just such a, a nail in the coffin that this means the end of your political career. He's been able to subvert uh, the, 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 those negative connotations in a way that's propelled his, his, his political ambitions. I want to read you a little snippet of your piece for Forbes, and if you could dive a little deeper in there for us after I'm done. You wrote this, not only does, for, or does, not only does Trump know how his people make meaning, but he also knows how to communicate with them in such a way that he's able to consistently achieve meaning congruence when he engages them. Can you explain that a little bit for us? Yeah, I mean, the best marketers know this well, that marketers don't make meaning, we signal it. We signal meaning, and then people observe they apprehend what we have communicated and they translate it through their cultural frames and based on how they see the world that communication being implicit or explicit now takes on uh, a translation that they have constructed and when good marketers are able to achieve meaning congruence it's done because of their proximity their intimacy with the people and this i think is really sort of what trump has done the best 
in his in his political career is that he's been able to signal to communicate both implicitly and explicitly in a way that speaks directly to the cultural frames by which his people his supporters see the world i mean even the language make america great again he was signaling dog whistling if you will to a group of people who felt unheard unseen forgotten right uh dismissed out of the american dream and he finally said finally someone said it and that language that vernacular has been the gospel for them and the way he communicates to them he communicates directly to them speaking directly at them they feel seen and as a result they are activated and then they go activate other people who are just like them and they activate people just like them and they find the network effects that propagate within the, the, the population meaning congruence this is when we communicate in such a way that our intentions are translated uh directly by the people in such a way that there is congruence and we're talking to them in a way that they understand and us them and we find ourselves in simpatico. We find ourselves so connected that the, the ability to be detethered, regardless of the facts, regardless of the rationalities, regardless of the evidence, those things are superfluous. They're meaningless because of how connected we are. And people are willing to do mental gymnastics to rationalize and justify why they do what they do because of the shared beliefs. In this conversation, you've mentioned really the negative implications of this type of marketing. What can we as Americans, maybe political leaders, brands take away from this Trump's marketing exercise, essentially? Yeah, I think that for us as citizens of the world, it's walking away with this truth, that there is no objective truth in the world. The world is subjective. It's not objective. Right? For some, a cow is leather. For others, it's a deity. For some, it's dinner. For some, a rug is decor. For some, it's a souvenir. Some, it's a place of worship. Which one is it? It's all of those things, depending on who you are and how you see the world. And if we can, if we can grapple with that truth, that our truth isn't the only truth, then if we find ourselves in a world where we could be much more sympathetic, much more empathetic, right? That I realize that, hey, you see the world one way, I see it another way. But that's okay. So long as your truth doesn't mean my oppression, we can coexist, right? And it helps us, you know, it helps us uh, uh, see the world in a much more vivid way. Like if you imagine social living as a basketball game, people who have courtside seats see a different game than those who have nosebleed seats. But we're looking at the exact same game. And the idea then is that we get a better understanding of the game of life, if you will, if we sit in more seats realizing that our seat isn't the only seat. Ergo, our truth isn't the only truth. If we wanna get a better representation of the world, then we need to see the world through other people's lenses. And what Trump's marketing and those who do marketing like that, both in, in, in ways that are nefarious and ways that are, are productive, it just illuminates and underscores that very, that very reality. The reality is not objective, it's subjective. And therefore, if we can see and, and realize that our worldview isn't the only worldview, then we're able just to be better citizens, just be, just be better cohabitants of this thing that we call Earth. Dr. Marcus Collins, I appreciate your insights. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me.